This is the presentation for Chapter A6, Subjective Probability. The outline of the presentation includes objectives of this chapter, key concepts, what is subjective probability, preparation, team elicitation, documenting results, coherence checks, and lastly, we'll have an exercise. The objectives is to understand what subjective probability is, how to prepare for estimating probability subjectively, how to under evaluate evidence in estimating probabilities, ways to understand ways to estimate subjective probabilities that minimize most biases, pitfalls in documenting results, and how to perform coherence checks on subjective probabilities. Note, biases will not be discussed in detail here. This Facilitators are encouraged to read the manual for a better understanding of biases and how to minimize them. The key concepts include estimating subjective probabilities is difficult for most people initially. Several steps can aid in estimating reasonable probabilities subjectively. These include selecting experienced facilitators to guide the process, establishing proper groups for estimating, preparation, problem definition, unbiased identification of pros and cons, establishing aids for making numerical estimates, making estimates and discussing reasoning within the group, performing coherence checks, and building the case. Note that many of the ideas in this presentation came from Stephen Vick's book, Degrees of Belief, Subjective Probability, and Engineering Judgment, which can be obtained from ASCE Press. So what is subjective probability? A subjective probability estimate is the numerical value or range of values judged to be believable based upon the available evidence. Subjective probability estimates are typically made to represent the likelihood of each event for a potential failure mode that has been decomposed for event tree analysis. Why do we use subjective probability? For many dams and levee safety applications, there is limited statistical data to work with. We are evaluating the conditional probabilities of events that have not been experienced or whose precursor events have not yet actually occurred. In addition, we are evaluating probabilities for which there are no analytical methods for computing them. For example, Tozaghi said the mechanics of piping defy theoretical approach. This leads to the question, how can I estimate a probability when I don't know? Not knowing is the essence of uncertainty. Subjective probability does not require us to know, only to honestly consider what we don't know and what we know. A subjective probability estimate is an expression of our state of knowledge at the moment. Whenever new information becomes available or the state of knowledge changes, our estimated risk might need to as well. The matter of probability assignment can be approached from two perspectives. Inductive reasoning is a top-down approach based fundamentally on available data and its interpretation. An inductive type of analysis answers the basic question of what happens if? Logic moves from cause to effect. Deductive reasoning is a bottom-up approach of generating knowledge and then data based on fundamental physics. A deductive type of analysis answers the basic, basic question of how can a particular outcome to come to pass? Logic moves from effect to cause. Most engineers and scientists are used to the deductive reasoning. Follow the deterministic procedure and the answer is no. Estimating probabilities requires inductive reasoning. Weighting the evidence and arguments, evaluating the uncertainty, and estimating a number based on this information. A shift in thinking may be difficult for some and procedures have been developed to help. There are two types of information that assessors must synthesize when making probability estimates. Frequency information deals with how often something occurs. A common example is historical failure rates. However, they must be used with caution because of the general method in which they were developed. The probabilities may be more representative of several event tree probabilities, and the inventory of dams or levees used to develop the rates may not be appropriate for the project being evaluated. 
casual information deals with indicators that might suggest future performance. Examples include a similar case history, analysis results, construction details, or past performance. Preparation. Selecting an experienced facilitator to guide the process is essential. Agencies will have guidelines for facilitator qualifications, but some of the key elements are listed here. Experience is very important, along with ensuring a proper team is selected for the subject matter. The facilitator also needs to be able to guide a diverse team through the process of estimating probabilities by maintaining the integrity of the process, asking the right questions, engaging the group, and critically evaluating the results for coherence and reasonableness. Probability estimates are typically done in a team setting with a diverse group of qualified people where synergy enhances and draws out the breadth of experience brought to the table by a group of individuals qualified to make the estimates. Team members can enter into discussions that will allow the group to arrive at a more comprehensive estimate than each individual could make on their own. Teams should not be too large as they tend to get bogged down wasting time and resources, nor too small as to preclude the appropriate interchange. Advanced preparation includes obtaining and reviewing as much original information as possible on the background and performance of the facility. There is often more than you think, and you may have to look in unconventional places to find it, like project offices, records holding, national archives, university or public libraries. Teams will also need to become familiar with any applicable frequency information, relative case histories, and available analyses but must be careful of other summaries and interpretations of the original information. Team elicitation is a facilitated process to draw out or elicit a response, typically a probability estimate, but could also be an input parameter to an analysis. The overall process can simply be described as estimate, discuss, and estimate again if necessary. Potential failure modes must be clearly defined from initiation to failure or breach with the full sequence of events described so that they can be decomposed into events that constitute an event tree. Therefore, is the blueprint for the risk analysis. Decomposition is also key to ensuring estimates are within the well calibrated range discussed later in this presentation. A clear and unambiguous description of the event probability to be estimated must be written down to ensure all estimators are on the same page. It is helpful to start with a generic event tree for the potential failure mode under consideration. Common event trees typically lead to more consistency and the manual includes such examples which are intended to be a starting point and must be adapted for the specific conditions being evaluated. A clear and unambiguous description of the event probability to be estimated is needed so that the entire team is on the same page. While this may not be put on the event tree, the description needs to be captured somewhere. In this example, an event is described as poor pressures rise. Will all team members interpret this, if this uh, same, interpret this the same based on this inadequate description? Where do the poor pressures rise? By how much? What are the possible outcomes given this rise occurs? Evidence making an event more likely and less likely must be thoroughly identified and collected. This is typically done in a two column table format for each event or node in the event tree. When estimating probabilities, not all evidence may be given equal weight or any weight. Be careful of hearsay evidence and seek out corroborating information. Be objective as possible with estimates and make the best estimate, not a conservative estimate, due to the significant investments that are involved with remediation and repair. Clearly document the evidence so that someone who is not at the meeting or picking this up years later would really understand what the team was thinking.
All final probabilities are estimated using team, team elicitation procedures based upon the totality and strength of the evidence. In most cases, the evidence will be more heavily weighted one way or the other, but one factor may be given much more weight than a large number of factors. In this example, the first statement is pretty strong and raises the possibility that internal erosion initiated at some reservoir level. However, as can be seen from the questions raised at the bottom, it should carry very little weight until it can be confirmed and the questions answered. Answering these types of questions can help a team decide which arguments are the strongest and should carry the most weight. This is an example of the two column table format for more likely and less likely factors. This is an example for an event involving initiation of internal erosion through an embankment dam abutment into a drainage tunnel. Key factors can be bolded. Similar tables would be prepared for each event or node in the event tree. The probability of some event outcomes cannot be calculated or determined from statistical data. In this case, it is necessary to estimate probabilities judgmentally. For some people, estimating numerical probabilities does not come naturally. It is often helpful to have some tools to aid in this effort. This slide shows one such tool, a verbal probability mapping scheme. A psychology experiment asks people to describe the probability of known events using everyday words shown in the left-hand column, ranging from virtually impossible to virtually certain. The results show that most people were pretty well calibrated between values of 0.01 and 0.99 as shown in the right-hand column, where the median and range of estimates are also shown. We use this modified version of the table to capture the potential for a larger range of estimates due to the possibility of more certainty in some estimates. For example, the probability that the concrete is saturated and cracked. Although you should consider decomposing the failure mode further if you tend to make a lot of virtually impossible estimates. <clears throat> in other words, a separate node for the concrete is saturated and the concrete is cracked if that can make sense in an event sequence. When estimating probabilities, is not a, it is not a good time to go fast. We want the case to stand up to the scrutiny of a diverse group of reviewers. The integrity of the process is important. Each team member should make an initial probability estimate on their own before hearing others' estimates. This helps avoid the bandwagon effect or anchoring bias. For example, following the opinion of the smartest looking person or the loudest person in the room and it forces each team member to critically think about the evidence and likelihood of the event. Each team member is asked to reveal their estimate. Following this initial anonymous round of estimating, there is a discussion of the results. Open discussion encourages group interaction and provides insight into different interpretations and improves overall understanding. Probability estimates may all clump together about some common value. They may vary widely. They may clump in two or more groups, or there may be a common group with one or two outliers. The discussion is, critically, is critical, especially if the estimates are spread over a wide range or there are outliers. The facilitator should call upon representatives of the differing groups, for example, those with high estimates, low estimates, and middle estimates, to explain why it was they held a particular belief in light of the evidence common to all. This should generate additional discussion. Agreement between the estimators might indicate everyone is interpreting the information in the same way. Huge scatter and disagreement might indicate a poorly defined event. Adjustments to the event description to make it clearer or further decomposition into additional events may be necessary. Disagreement might indicate that some estimators are mistaken about the importance of particular evidence, or they hold different views in mind about geologic models or design or construction details. 
some estimators may have a totally different interpretation of the data or expected performance. It is important to understand why they held a particular belief. The rest of the team may need to adjust their estimates if persuaded by the discussion or the outlier may have misinterpreted the evidence. In most cases, following the discussion, consensus can be reached. The median value of the team is usually a good place to start for a consensus. The median is the measure of the central tendency of a small data set, whereas the mean or average can be unreasonably skewed by one estimate. If the team cannot come to a consensus, it will be necessary to carry both or multiple estimates through the inventory analysis, documenting the reasons for each. The estimation process is applied to estimating the most likely probability and the tails, low and high values, and the median value of each is obtained. Remember to elicit, discuss, and settle on a consensus value before going on to the next question. Although often all questions or just the bounds can be elicited at the same time, but discussed individually. If there is no reason to believe that the value is more likely to be between the high and low value, a uniform distribution will result in the low as the minimum and the high as the maximum, and no estimate for the most likely value. However, most elicitations will result in triangular distributions with the high as the maximum, the low as the minimum, and the best estimate as the mode, as shown on the following slide. This slide shows the difference between a uniform and triangular distribution. The uniform distribution or boxcar because of its shape is bounded is a bounded distribution defined by a lower and upper bound where the range of values are equally probable. The mean of the distribution is simply the average of the lower and upper bound. This is a good distribution to use when you have a good idea of the possible range but are very uncertain about where within the range a value is most likely to fall. A triangular distribution is defined by a lower bound, upper bound, and a most likely value. For this distribution, the mean is equally sensitive to each parameter. It has no theoretical basis, but derived its statistical properties from its geometry. It is popular during team elicitations because of its simplicity and versatility along with the intuitive nature of its defining parameters. The most likely or mode value is not the best or mean estimate, except in the special case where there is no skew. A best estimate of risk should never be taken as the most likely value of a triangular distribution. It should be the mean. Documenting results of the team elicitation. Case must be built for each probability estimate, highlighting the key pieces of evidence. Teams have misused and misunderstood the practices of highlighting or bolding key factors in the more and less likely tables. A common example is highlighting multiple factors on both the more likely and less likely side and making an estimate that is obviously weighted one way or the other with no other explanation. The highlighted factors should be only be the uh, key factors that drive the estimate. When multiple factors are highlighted, there needs to be an explanation of how the team weighted the evidence and why. If the team cannot come to a consensus, both or multiple estimates are carried through the inventory analysis along with a rationale to demonstrate, demonstrate the sensitivity of the results for each on the dam safety case and path forward. If it matters, this usually leads to recommendations for additional investigation in an attempt to improve the understanding and reduce uncertainty. After the team elicitations are made, it is essential to perform coherence checks to make sure of entry rule, rules were not violated. Probabilities are monotonically increasing and an overall gut check based on the evidence. This is typically accomplished after each potential failure mode is estimated and after all failure modes are estimated. 
After each potential failure mode is estimated, plot the system response curve to review its shape and inflection points, and plot the risk for the potential failure mode on a little FN chart to see if the overall results make sense. After all potential failure modes are estimated, plot the results on a little FN chart to see if the overall results for the facility make sense. This concludes the presentation.